All right, y'all know that we've been going over the uh, confessional statements, um, whether it be the um, Belgian Confession, uh, the, the Heidelberg Confession. Um, we've pretty well zeroed in on the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, along with the Westminster Catechism. Um, those are those are the standards, I guess you could say. Um, the, the Belgic Confession definitely came first, but the uh, Westminster Confession is probably the gold standard in confessional statements, and then, of course, the Second London Baptist Confession is not not a whole lot different than that until you get to some, some of the ordinances and things of that nature, the sacraments. Um, we are looking at point 18, the assurance of grace and salvation. We will be studying the last point if you will. So we'll go over that. Uh, we're going to wrap it up today. Uh, we might even get done early. Right? Uh, uh, anybody not have notes? You don't have notes? Alright, good deal. Mm -hmm. you, all, you good on notes? He's got you. You want, you want, I got plenty. He's got, he's got plenty. I, I don't have my reading glasses today. You don't have your reading glasses? <laughs> so it really wouldn't do you any good. Today, but I'm here. All right, well, um, if you do have your reading glasses and uh, you've got your stuff in front of you, we've got, again, go over how we conduct this. We've got the confessional statement on one, uh, on one hand, and then the other hand we've got the scripture references. And those are labeled. If you can understand my labeling there, um, then uh, that's how we do this. So, in other words, we have a confessional statement, a doctrinal statement, right? And those are approved by the scriptures, correct? So, this is the scripture verses that uh, prove what we just said about the confessional statement. So, we'll bounce back and forth quite a bit, right? Uh, everybody got how it's working? All right. Hey, Shane, he's got reading glasses now, so. She just not gonna take no, right? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I got, I got a <laughs> so are we again today we're on point four of this confessional statement. Now again, as the pattern that we always do, we'll read over the confessional statement, then we'll zero in on the point that we have for today. Uh, just to kind of get it ingrained, I've got uh, another... Uh, I, I printed something off. Um, it's just, uh, it's kind of confusing if you don't know what you're, what, what you're looking at, but it, it's from a, uh, from a guy named uh, Hodge. I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, Charles Hodge and A.A. A. Hodge, but his son A.A. A. Hodge, Alexander Hodge, wrote a commentary on the confession, and I looked, o looked it over this morning, and I was like, I'm going to print that off because I want, I want you all to hear what he has to say about it. Um, and that's just, we'll do that afterwards, just, just to kind of wrap up the, the, this particular point of, of assurance of grace and salvation. Um, <laughs> So let's start at 18.1. Temporary believers and other unregenerate people may deceive themselves in vain with false hopes and fleshly presumptions that they have God's favor and salvation. But their hope will perish. Yet those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love Him sincerely, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before Him, may, certainly, may be certainly assured in this life that they are in a state of grace. <laughs> They may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and this hope will never make them ashamed. All right, so again, we're talking about the assurance of hope, right? Uh, our assurance of grace and salvation. Now, there is a difference. Assurance of faith is what is summed up in the Scripture, right? We, we know that what the Bible says about the faith is true, correct? That's the assurance of faith. But we're talking about the assurance of hope for individuals like you and I our assurance that we are named among the redeemed, right? 
So, uh, any questions regarding that? Let's see real quick. So I think I had a third page. I told you I was going to wait to the end, but I don't think I am. Um, let's read section two. Uh, this certainly is not merely an inconclusive or likely persuasion based on a fallible hope. It is an infallible assurance of faith founded on the blood and the righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel. It is also built on the inward evidence of those graces in the Spirit about which promises are made. It is further based on the testimony of the Spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are children of God. As a fruit of this assurance, our hearts are kept both humble and holy. Which spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, whereby we are sealed with the day of redemption? Uh, listen to what Hodge says about those first two points. He says, <clears throat> there is a false assurance of salvation. Now he's explaining one and two in his own you know, words. He says, there is a false assurance of salvation, which unregenerate men sometimes indulge. In other words, again, if I draw your attention again to point one, we just studied temporary believers and other unregenerate people may deceive themselves in vain with false hopes and fleshly, fleshly presumptions that they have God's favor and salvation. All right. Uh, there is, on the other hand, back over here to, to, well, you don't have this copy. There is, on the other hand, a true assurance amounting to an infallible certainty which sincere believers may entertain as to their own personal salvation which shall not be confounded. Uh, this infallible assurance of faith rests upon the divine truth of the promise of salvation upon the inward evidence of those graces into which those promises are made. The testimony of the spirit of adoption witnessing with our spirits that we are children of God. Again, just an overview uh, of what point one and two just said, right? Listen to what he says here. Uh, just You don't have this again, but just listen to what he says about temporary unbelievers. He says, unregenerate men, beguiled by the nature, excuse me, beguiled by the natural desire for happiness. Now, let me pause. We, we know those folks, right? We know the folks that um, they think they're saved because, you know, they walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, maybe it was vacation Bible school or something like that. Uh, the, you know, mom and dad or grandma and grandpa took them to church, and now grandma and grandpa's gone, so they don't have to go anymore, all that kind of stuff, right? You, you know those folks, right? This, this guy's describing, now this is what point one, this is the person they're describing. Unregenerate men beguiled by the natural desire for happiness, flattered by self-love, and betrayed by a spirit of self-righteousness, and self-confidence should frequently indulge in an unfounded assurance of their own gracious condition. It is, is rendered and exceedingly probable from what we know of human nature. In other words, we know this by human nature. Mankind naturally has a desire for happiness, naturally has a self-love, and that self-love betrays them into convincing them or giving them a false hope of salvation. Right? Uh... And it's rendered certain as a fact from common observation and from declarations of the Scripture. Uh, so we know that that exists, right? Uh, that in mankind in general, uh, somebody who is not a Christian, not saved, is a uh, uh, you know they may have a you know have been to church before, um, and they think they're good um, because because of that, and they it usually plays out in their behavior, right? They just do whatever, you know. They have no problem uh, with any uh, of, of, of their own sensual desires or whatever it might be. Listen to what he says about true assurance. And again, just a recapping of 18, 1 and 2. He says, true assurance, however, may be distinguished from that which is false by the following test. He says, true assurance begets, begets unfeigned humility. So, you're not fake in your, in your humility. False assurance begets spiritual pride. So there's the difference. You have the spiritual pride of false assurance. True assurance begets unfeigned humility. True, the true leads to increased diligence in the practice of holiness. And the, floss, the false leads to sloth and self-indulgence. 
The true leads to candid, candid self-examination and a desire to, to be searched and corrected by God. The false leads to a disposition to be satisfied with appearance and to avoid the accurate investigation. The true leads to constant aspirations after more uh, intimate fellowship with God. Okay, so there's a difference between the false there and the uh, the true. What is true assurance? Uh, any questions? No? Okay, let's read point three and point four, and then we'll bounce back to, to what Hodge says, and then we'll get, begin investigating what the scriptures say. Uh, this infallible assurance is not such an essential part of the faith that it is always fully experienced alongside of faith. Again, so there are those that struggle with it, right? That's who we're talking about, right? Again, I believe we've asked the question several times, has anybody ever doubted salvation, had a problem with assurance? I don't think me and one other person raised our hand, right? Everybody else is good. <laughs> <laughs> so the infallible assurance is not such an essential part. And pause for just a minute. I just want to clarify something real quick. The reformers, Martin Luther, Melanchthon, uh, uh, Calvin, those guys, um, they were different. Over time, we have embraced that the assurance of faith is not essential. So they would have taught, uh, and this is where we would differ, they would have taught that, that if you don't have assurance, then you don't have faith. Okay? I don't think... I think most of the Reformed theology has, has left that particular view, right? But they would have thought that. And there are still some today that, that believe that, but we, of course, don't. There's too many examples from Scripture. You've got all of 1 John, for example, that, that you know we write this to you that you may know, which implies they probably didn't know if they were saved or not, right? So the infallible assurance is not such an essential part of the faith that it always fully experienced alongside of faith. Uh, in other words, you don't know, right, sometimes. But true believers may wait a long time and struggle with many difficulties before obtaining it. Yet, with the enabling of the Spirit to know the things freely given to them by God, they may attain this assurance using ordinary means appropriately without extraordinary revelation. In other words, uh, you, you use it by you know studying the Scripture. They're going to list the ordinary means here in just a moment. Uh, but uh, it, it, without ex any extraordinary revelation. In other words, it's not some secret knowledge that's given to only a select few, right? Uh, you don't have a second baptism of the Holy Spirit or something, second blessing, right? Uh, as our Pentecostal brothers teach. Um, that's, not, that's, that's not what we're talking about. There's, there's only one revelation, that's the Bible, right? Uh, now, the prophets and the apostles, they had extraordinary revelation, they wrote it down, and for us, that's ordinary revelation, meaning the Bible. That makes sense? Therefore, it is the duty of all to be as diligent as possible to make their calling and election sure. Peter, Peter says that in 1.10, right? Uh, you are diligency. Your assurance of your salvation, assurance of the hope in, in, that is in you, comes by being diligent and making sure you're calling an election sure. In this way, their hearts may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit and love and thankfulness to God and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience. These effects are the natural fruits of this assurance. Thus, it does not at all encourage believers to be negligent. Okay. Any questions? Are you, are you, you understand what, what we're going through? Your, your faith, your salvation is all of God, correct? And your assurance of your salvation works in tandem with your obedience, with your uh, diligence, and things of that nature. Does that make sense? Now, again, we have to be able to differentiate. There are those who are not saved and and they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. We see that warning in Scripture, right? We, we have to mine out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Is that correct? So we do see that. But as far as your assurance goes, uh, uh, well, we'll see in point four. Point four. 
It says, true believers may in various ways have the assurance of their salvation shaken, decreased, or temporarily lost. Alright? You see that point? You may have their assurance of salvation shaken, decreased, or temporarily lost. Why does this happen? This may happen because they neglect to preserve it. Uh, You've not read the scriptures, you've not prayed, you've not been in, intimate in your relationship with God, uh, you've you've just neglected it, right? Or fall into some specific sin that wounds their conscience and grieves the spirit. That happens too, right? Any questions on that? We lose our assurance of salvation sometimes because of sin, Right? Because of sin, it may happen through some unexpected or forceful temptation, or when God, listen to this, withdraws the light of his face, his countenance, and allows even those who fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Yet they are never completely lacking the seed of God, the life of faith, love of Christ and the brethren, sincerity of heart, or conscience concerning their uh, faith, excuse me, uh, concerning their duty, out of these graces, through the work of the Spirit, this assurance may, at the proper time, be revived. In the meantime, they are kept from utter despair through them. All right, let's see what Hodge says. Just listen with me as I read what Hodge says, and then we'll dump to the, to the Scriptures um, piece by piece. Um, Hodge says... These sections teach, one, that this infallible assurance is not the essence of faith. Um, in other words, it's not, it's not completely tied to, to, to your faith. In other words, again, um, the, it's, just because you don't have the assurance of salvation does not mean you also don't have faith. And just because you have faith does not necessarily mean that you're going to have the assurance of, of, of salvation. Right? That makes sense? That on the contrary, man may be a true believer and yet destitute of this assurance. Uh, that being, nevertheless, as, as nevertheless as taught in the preceding sections, attainable in this life in the use of ordinary means without extraordinary revelation, it is consequently the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling election sure. Again, just giving a, a summary of point three there. Because this assurance, instead of inclining men to negligence, tends to increase, tends to properly increase. Listen to that. Because this assurance, instead of inclining men to negligence, tends properly to increase a spiritual peace and joy, love and thankfulness to God, and strength and cheerfulness to the works of obedience. In other words, instead of inclining you and me, what assurance does, instead of giving making us lazy, slothful, right? It promotes, it tends properly to increase spiritual peace and joy, love and thankfulness to God, and strength and cheerfulness in the works of obedience. It encourages us to continue, right? True believers have, after having attained this assurance, may have it shaken, diminished, or intermittent, the cause or occasions of which are such as negligence of preserving this grace and full exercise, falling into some special sin, some sudden or vehement temptations, uh, God's temporary withdrawing of, his light, of the light of his countenance. All right, fourth, nevertheless, since, as was shown under ch uh, chapter 17, in other words, in the confessional statement, the previous point, point 17, was remember perseverance of the saints, right? Y'all remember the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. We can't ever fall away from grace. Amen. We are saved for the uttermost, right? Uh, you can say once saved, always saved. I like it said better, if saved, always saved. But um, um, we cannot fall away completely from grace. We're always saved. It says no true believer is ever permitted totally to fall away from grace. He is never left in, entirely without any token of God's favor. And the root of faith remaining, this assurance may in time be revived. Uh, and again, um, this is all tied to God's working. Um, uh, so it's uh, this is just uh, um, 
it's tied to God's working and um, also our diligence. Okay, so let's uh, bounce back to uh, to uh, eighteen four, and let's uh, let's look at the scripture references to it. You might have to thumb through your scripture references to get there. Point. On page eight. Page eight. Thank you, Ms. Lee. If we've got time, I'll read that. may in various ways have the assurance of their salvation shaken, decreased, or temporarily lost. Again, it's not talking about your faith or your salvation, right? We're talking about the assurance of your salvation, right? The assurance of your salvation. <clears throat> decreased, shaken, or temporarily lost. This may happen. Why? Why does this happen? Because you neglect to preserve it or fall into some specific sin that wounds your conscience and grieves the spirit. That that can happen quite frequently, King. I'm talking about the, the sin part, right? That uh, you you neglect to preserve it. How how often do we get lazy and we um, we don't read our scriptures? Maybe we don't pray. Um, How often does that happen? We neglect to preserve it. Again, this walk of faith that we have, this it is uh, it's imperative that we uh, that we study the Bible, right? Imperative, imperative that we hear the preaching of the Lord. You know what the Psalm says? The Psalm says that um, he that t- uh, turns his ear from hearing the word of God, even his prayer, is an abomination. That's tough, isn't it? How often have you uh, thought to run to God and something happens and then you haven't uh, you ain't been reading or studying or listening to the preaching of God's Word or anything for the last week? That makes sense? All right. So we often neglect to preserve our assurance. We fall into some specific sin the old man always wants to, to come out, doesn't he? There's always, he's always there. I don't know uh, if y'all struggle with that part of it. Uh, the old person, the old man, but uh, Paul Paul said that uh, he has to die daily, right? That the good that he wants to do, he does not do. And he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Paul, he was struggling with, right? We have this Sin. We live in a body that has an appetite for it. Um, you know, we're we're saved. We're seated in the heavenlies. We've been given a mind of Christ. We're on the road to sanctification. We're 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 going to be glorified, but we still fall into sin, right? <clears throat> it's a sin that wounds our conscience, grieves the spirit of God, right? That happens. That's why Paul said, do not grieve the Spirit of God, right? Because it's going to impact you. It has severe implications. It may happen through some unexpected or forceful temptation. You know, perhaps, um, you know, how, how often has people doubted their salvation in the midst of trial or temptation? There's the, you know, think Think about the uh, Diocletian uh, persecutions. Remember when we when we looked at those? We're studying church history right up until you get almost to Nicaea. There's a 
great outburst of persecution that takes place against with with Emperor Diocletian. Remember that? And then he's he. I mean, it was so great, so heavy. Uh, and when Constantine finally, when I had the council at Nicaea, and Constantine walks in, he greets Pathanutius with a kiss because of his intense persecution that he that he suffered. You think some of those saints that had those persecutions that that that, that was under those temptations to take that pinch of incense and cast it, or be fed to the lions? Do you don't think that they question whether or not they that they were actually saved? There's some great temptations there, right? Great trials. Unexpected things that happen. Um, I can't help but think about my wife's sister and her husband committed suicide and, and she's left with uh, with her you know her son uh, who's handicapped. What uh, she might have some thought doubts at end times, don't she? She's she's gonna be struggling for a long time. Um, and she is. She's keep her in your prayer. She's she's having a rough time. Um, there's no there's no let up. There's there's no relief. Me and Crystal can't help with her with her son. You know we can't take him for a couple of days and just let her get away. Um, there's no relief for her. And uh, that 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 comes with probably some doubts. She's probably struggling, right? Um, just there's all kinds of that stuff. That have happened throughout life. That's why we have to have. That's why we have to be rooted in Scripture. That makes sense. This is why it's imperative that we teach these doctrines. That we teach. That's why I can't. That's why it's just impossible. And, and it makes me so mad when preachers have some name it, claim it, feel good message every week. There's never. There's never any deep dive into into. Um, the study of Scripture, uh, uh, the illustrations of Scripture, there's, there's nothing there uh, that's meat. So when, when temptation comes, when, when, the, when something unexpected happens, people are absolutely, at a, at a, they don't have any clue what to do. This is why we have to be so grounded in our faith. You want to know why kids, when they leave home, they go out and they, they, they live like hell. When they get to college, they participate in the, in the, 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 the ways of the world. A part of it has to do because they're not saved. You know, they've walked some aisle, prayed some prayer, got into the baptistry, made mom and dad happy, made me, mom, papa happy, and that was it. But part of it's because they've had no discipleship at all. No, no, some preacher was always worried about some woman getting mad at him, and he'd be down the road next week. So he, he sugarcoated his message. And it's happened. It's happened all the time. And those guys are the reason I'm never got to stay in a church, right? <laughs> but uh, it's un something unexpected, forceful temptation happens, or when God withdraws His light of His countenance, the light of His face, and that allows even those who fear Him to walk in darkness. A lot of times that happens with, with um, just a, a discipline, right? Uh, maybe you have sinned, maybe you've got into some sin, and He has withdrawn... Um, it's seemingly withdrawn his presence from you, right? And I said seemingly, because God's always with us, right? With the light of his countenance, he's pulled away, and he's disciplined us. Um, let's go to our scripture verses, Psalm 51. Y'all remember Psalm 51 is, uh, anybody know what Psalm 51 is? Anybody familiar? Nobody? I know Beverly knows. Psalm 51 is David's prayer. Right? After when? Nathan the prophet came to him and said, you're the man. Right? So this is his psalm of repentance. After he sinned with Bathsheba, killed Uriah, he says, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud for your righteousness. Y'all got your Bibles with you? 
I think Psalm 51 is a perfect example of when what happens when some grievous sin takes away the assurance of salvation. <clears throat> well, there's probably nothing more grievous when it comes to sin is what David did, right? Psalm 51. Y'all know the story of what David did, right? Committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then she got pregnant out of the deal, so he decided to have Uriah killed because Uriah wouldn't... He tried to cover it up at first. He tried to call for Uriah maybe to have a discussion about some military strategies or whatever under under that guise. And he said, hey, by the way, you're... We'll just leave tomorrow. You go, go with your, uh, go be with your wife tonight. Well, that didn't quite work out. Uriah didn't go into his wife. He said, "My men are not with my, with their wives. I'm not going to be with mine." So he slept outside. So David had him killed. He says, and so he's adultery and murder. That's there's nothing more grievous than what David did, right? That's, a, that's about the worst of the worst. Listen to what he says. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. He says, Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. So he feels filthy, right? Can you imagine what you would feel like if you did something like that? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Wow. I don't know how long it took for Nathan to come here, hear him, but it was some time, months, right? He says, my sin is always before me. Every time I wake up, every time I go to bed, it's there. Every move I make, every, t every time I breathe, everything, my sin is always before me. He says, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. But you may be found just when you speak. And blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Talking about depravity there, right? And in sin, my mother conceived me. That means every fiber of his of, of his body was, was conceived in sin. He was just sinful. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin to blot out all my iniquities. God's pulled away from him, right? You know, this, uh, this time was, was tough. He's, he's been extremely sinful. He's a murderer, adultery. He's broken two of the great commandments. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Make it be like it used to be. When I knew that I knew, right? When I had joy. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall uh, show forth your praise. Just pause for a minute. Well, remember, listen to what he says right there in verse 14. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. The guilt of sin has, has, has enough power in it to, uh, to cause us to doubt salvation. Right? And that's ultimately what we're really dealing with, right? We don't have the assurance of salvation so much because we do have guilt from whatever sin it might be. Not trusting in God. Maybe you've grievously sinned like David against God. And uh, you maybe you, nobody knows. You've not been caught, whatever. Um, you have this great guilt. Um, maybe it's something that, that, that is there all the time, you just can't give it up. It's an addiction, perhaps. 
And that, that's, that's what you're struggling with, right? You want the joy of salvation, right? And because there's no joy there and there's only guilt, then that's, that's what it's all summed up in, right? That's why it's imperative that we read the Scriptures, we, we, we have our minds changed, uh, because we, you know, it's, and that's, that's the only help that we can get is from the Holy Scriptures, from God's Word, and being obedient, repentance, right? Uh, any questions there? Right. Verse 15, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I'd give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite a heart, or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Uh, then they should offer bulls on your altar. <clears throat> That's Psalm 51. That is, to me, is the perfect example of someone who has, through his sin, had had God withdraw the light of his countenance on him. And he's grieving for it. He's doubting. He doesn't have the joy of salvation. Guilt is there. All of those things. Does that make sense? Any questions there? All right, let's go on to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. He says, And do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom we are sealed in the day of redemption. Uh, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Uh, so we've got to eliminate those things, correct? Uh, no bitterness, no wrath. We don't hold grudges. And again, that those things grieve the Spirit of God. Uh, and because of that, because of what you've done, Harboring bitterness, wrath, uh, anger, whatever it might be, um, grieve the spirit, and therefore your uh, your joy is extinguished, and now your um, uh, assurance of, of salvation is being in question. This is this question. Um, we'll we'll go to Psalm seventy-seven verses one through ten in a moment. Uh, I think there's another big chunk of scripture we got to look at, uh, too. Yeah, Psalm 88. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that in, in a moment. Matthew chapter 26, 69 through 72. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he divided it before them all, saying, I did not know what you were saying. And when he had gone out, to the gateway, another girl saw him and said, to him, "And said to those who were there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth." But again, he denied it with an oath, "I do not know the man." So, do you see that? I think we know that uh, Peter was miserable during this time uh, until Jesus reassured him, um, and it's all because of sin, right? All because he fell. Psalm 31, verse 22. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried out to you. God will answer when you call out, but you must pursue Him, right? Any questions? Isaiah, where are we at? Isaiah 50:10. Who among you fears the Lord, who obeys the voice of his servant, who walks in darkness and has no light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. So it's going to happen. There are those there that question their faith. They walk in darkness. They have no light. The scripture commands us, let us trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Again, I just want to reiterate, what does the Bible say? Um, it says, those that believe will never perish, right? The question is, is do you believe? If you're doubting your salvation, uh, you're, if, you, if you have the, a problem with the assurance of your salvation, well, uh, then some of us need to trust the Scriptures. And again, set aside those folks that, that we know or should truly doubt their salvation. That they, that, you know, there are those. But if you are a believer, if you truly believe, it's you believe the scriptures. Amen?
Repent from sin and believe the Scriptures. Okay? That will help your doubt. That will help your, uh, your lack of assurance. All right, back to the faith statement, right? It says, yet they are never completely lacking the seed of God. Again, we cannot lose our salvation, right? If we believe what the Scripture says, Jesus has saved us to the uttermost, right? He says, I will not cast you out, doesn't he? Now, do we believe what the Bible says? That means you should answer yes, right? We do believe what the Bible says, right? It's the infallible and errant Word of God. We learned that way back up in points 1 through 5, right? We believe what the Scripture says. So we're always saved. We're not going to lose our salvation. So if we're doubting the assurance, or if we're doubting our salvation, if, we're, if, we're, if we don't have the assurance of our salvation, one of two things is, is the problem. God. Uh, our assurance has been taken from us, or we don't, we're not saved at all, right? And they never were. That make sense? So we study the Bible, and we print, repent from sin, and uh, you believe the Bible, right? You believe the Bible. What does it say about me? I've confessed, I believe in Christ, I believe the Word of God, therefore I'm saved, I'm regenerate, and... If I'm doubting, then I need to address some things in my life, um, probably some sin or, or, or whatever it might be. Uh, we're never completely lacking the seed of God, the life of faith, love of Christ and the brethren, sincerity of heart or conscience concerning their duty. Of these graces through the work of the Spirit, again, that's so important. It's through the work of the Spirit, this assurance may at the proper time, be revived. Be revived. 1 John 3, 9. Whoever has been born of God abides, uh, does not, excuse me, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now again, we understand what's going on in 1 John. We're talking about the Gnostic heresies, right? And what it's, Sin, specific sin here he's talking about is falling victim to that particular heresy. Um, again, he does provide caveat. He says, he who has sinned, let him confess, right? And so if we, if, we, if we have sinned, we have an advocate for the fault from, in the Father. All right, so I mean, um, he says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That particular sin there uh, is the sin of Gnosticism that, that, that is in its infant stages there uh, to, to, to John's uh, readers. But it still has a universal application. Uh, whoever has been born of God does not sin. We do not remain in sin. We do not practice sin. When the truth is presented through the preaching of the Word or reading of the Word or whatever it might be, the identification uh, uh, of the Spirit pinpoints it in our life uh, through, through, through the study of His Word, then, then we don't remain in that sin. Uh, for His seed remains in Him and He cannot sin because He's been born of God. Uh, again, you cannot stay there. Okay? Does that make sense? Uh, Luke 22, verse 32, But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. He's talking to, to, to Peter there, right? Remember when Peter did not. So, uh, your, your faith, our faith itself is not going to fail, but our strength can. Uh, does that make sense? Job 13, 15. Job says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Uh, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. So Job may uh, Job's assurance was there. He may be struggling with some great temptation or tragedy, trial, and you know Job's problems were big, right? His entire family was taken from him. Uh, he had his wife still. Uh, she begged him to deny God uh, and end the suffering, but. Uh, he said, no, 
he, he knew who God was, right? He was not going to fall into that. He had the assurance. Uh, he may have doubted how much... Uh, he, he didn't doubt who God was. He may have doubted his own, but he didn't doubt who God was, and he was not going to fall victim to it. And for Job to say these things, Job doesn't have the full counsel of God's Word, does he, like we do? Um, this, so you're, the faith that Job has is definitely a faith from God. If there's anything that proves perseverance of the saints or God's election uh, and predestination and things like that, it's the book of Job. Uh, you know, God asked Satan, he says, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, now, if it hinged upon man's responsibility and man's choice or will, then God in no way is going to ask about Job or about his servant Job. But God knew that Job was saved because God's the one that saved him, right? And, uh, and, 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 and Job's, you can read Job's, when Job would speak, you know, cursed the day I was born, uh, you know, he, he struggled. And in the midst of his, all that, you can tell that he was, he, he, he may not have knew if he was saved, but he knew God was the truth, right? So whatever you're going through, whatever things are happening, um, know who God is. Right, and and then you may not it may not matter whether or not you believe that you're saved or not, but you know who God is, correct? Now we have something Job don't have. We have the promise of the written word of God. Amen. I don't know. Uh, he he didn't have it. The, the, Job is the oldest book in the Bible, right? It was written before uh, Moses wrote the uh, the Old Testament, or, you know, the Torah, right? So uh, Job, all Job had to go on was what was handed down from Adam, uh, or Noah and his sons, right? So, just trust in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. All right, uh, Psalm 7, 73, 15, If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. <clears throat> so, uh, again, the, some of these verses are kind of out there. You have to know the entire context of it. Uh, to make sense of it all, but uh, the psalmist here is uh, just presumptuously speaking upon, you know, when he says, I will speak thus, he's just kind of uh, putting himself, uh, or, or talking about just being uh, forward. <clears throat> uh, uh, but nonetheless, uh, Psalm, back to Psalm 51, again, it, We'll go back and look at Psalm 73 in a moment. But Psalm 51, verse 8 says, Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. And again, uh, Isaiah 50.10, we've already got that at the top of the page. Who among you fears the Lord, who obeys the voice of his servant, who walks in darkness, who has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his, uh, and rely upon his God. Um, in the meantime, they are kept from utter despair through them. Uh, and again, there's your scripture references. Uh, I want to read, uh, just encourage you, go back and study Psalm 73. Go back and study um, Psalm 88. Um, what else was there? Uh, yeah, Psalm 88, Psalm 77. Go back and read those things and then um, again, we're talking about um, the assurance of salvation being shaken, decreased, or temporarily lost. Um, and it works in tandem with our discipline and, and uh, pursuing God. Um, I wanted to read, let me see here, this right here. Y'all don't have this. Just listen real good. You can buy Hodges or he's talking about sections three and four here. All right. 
He says, these sections teach that this infallible assurance is not the essence of faith. That on the contrary, man may be a true believer and yet destitute of this assurance. That being, nevertheless, as taught in the preceding sections, attain, attainable in this life in the use of ordinary means. He's talking about section 3 and 4. Uh, or We're going over sections 3 and 4. When he makes reference to the preceding section, he's talking about section 1 and 2. So, again, point 18, you've got sections 1 and 2, and then 3 and 4. We just did 4, right? Hodge is talking about that. We're, we're going over section 3 and 4 in, in, his, in his study. And when he makes references to the preceding section, he's talking about 1 and 2. <clears throat> Alright, that again. We've got our basic understanding of, of, of the, the confessional statement there in front of us. You should have it working in your mind a little bit, right? He says that this infallible assurance is not the essence of faith. That on the contrary, a man may be a true believer and yet destitute of this assurance. That being, nevertheless, as taught in the preceding sections, attainable in this life in the use of ordinary means without extraordinary revelation. It is consequently the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure. So it's our duty as individuals to give all diligence to, to, to make our calling and election sure. Because this assurance, instead of inclining men to negligence, tends to properly increase, increase spiritual peace and joy, love and thankfulness to God, and strengthen and cheerfulness in the works of obedience. True believers, after having attained this assurance, may have it shaken, diminished, and intermitted, the cause or occasions of which are such as negligence in preserving this grace and full exercise, You've neglected this, your Bible study is one of those. You've neglected prayer. Amen. Falling into some special sin, some sudden and vehement temptations, God's temporary withdrawing of the light of His countenance. Nevertheless, since, as was shown under chapter 17, in other words, perseverance of the saints, no true believer is ever permitted to totally fall away from grace. He is never left entirely without any token of God's favor, and the root of faith remaining. This assurance may in due time be revived. All right, summary statements of, the, of, of, of what we just got through study. All right? Any questions? So, listen to this. Again, I just want you to understand the, what we're talking about with the assurance of your salvation. Amen? Since this infallible assurance is not of the essence of faith, but its fruit and one of the highest attainments of divine life. In other words, when it says not the essence of faith, it's not you're saved. But that does not mean that you have the assurance of your, of your salvation. <clears throat> one of the highest, he says it's one of the highest attainments of the divine life. And since it may be attained in this life in the use of ordinary means, whatever scripture says, right? Without extraordinary revelation, you're not sitting in some trance and you, re you receive this because of some second blessing, baptism of the Holy Spirit or whatever they call it. You're not going to break out into convulsions or swing from chandeliers or, or whatever it might be. Does that make sense? It follows necessarily that its attainment is a duty as well as a grace. Does that make sense? Your salvation is all the work of God. Right? It is a my means of grace. But your assurance of salvation, the joy of salvation, is a duty as well as a grace. In other words, we have to strive for that. We can't neglect the Scriptures. We can't neglect those things. And that, all, uh, that all that leads to it should be diligently sought. And that all that prevents it should be carefully avoided. We repent from sin and we study God's Word, and we pursue what the Bible calls holy, right? Genuine assurance cannot lead to looseness and indifference and, is, uh, and, uh, and indifference in the cultivation of grace and the performance of religious duties, since its very existence depends on upon the evidence afforded by, diligent, uh, by diligence in those duties and by the strength of those graces. 
we are true believers and upon the approving witness of the Holy Spirit, as we have seen above under sections 1 and 2. A false presumption, a false presumptuous assurance is to be discriminated from a genuine assurance by, cer uh, by certain clear practical marks. On the contrary, genuine assurance naturally leads to a legitimate and abiding peace and joy and to love and to thankfulness and these from the very laws of our being to greater buoyancy, strength, and cheerfulness in the practice of obedience in every department of duty. It hence follows that every principle of self-interest and every obligation resting upon us as Christians conspire to induce us to all diligence in seeking the full attainment and abiding enjoyment of this grace. Okay? You see what we're talking about here. If you're doubting your salvation, if you're doubting your salvation, it's either because of some sin or because of some um, temptation or some trial, whatever it might be, uh, you, you must usually, and I, I don't make this as a blanket statement, but usually it's because of laziness, slothfulness, right? Uh, spiritual spiritual laziness. That is, if there's any one common theme in Western Christianity, it is, there is a, uh, a, a growing negligence. This is the reason for all the, the name it and claim it, blab it and, blab it and grab it groups and all the, uh, the, the, the charismatic people. They're, it's all fake, okay? And it's because they're lazy. Or, and we are naturally lazy, right? We, we, we would rather have some miracle uh, work that, that God gives us some enlightened understanding of something instead of studying to show thyself a proof, right? Uh, and that's why, most of the time, that's why we uh, have a doubt or, a, uh, or we're not assured of our salvation. Okay, let me uh, let me just read this. Uh, I don't think I'm about done. Let's just be done. Okay. Any questions? I could go on and on and on. I could read commentary after commentary and whatever. Y'all get the gist, though, right? Your salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, right? The assurance of your salvation is diligently sought for, along with. God helping, right? or helping. God does most of the work. He causes us to grow and all those things. But there is responsibility, right? We have to repent from sin. We have to study the scriptures. We have to 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 uh, follow Christ, right? Be Christians. That makes sense. That's where the assurance of salvation comes from. Okay. God gives us the ability to do it. That makes sense. But. Our discipline helps. All right? Helps with our assurance. So, no more doubt, right? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you again so much for your word. We pray that your name be glorified in us. The preaching of your word this morning and this evening, Lord, we pray that uh, it would bring glory and honor to your name. And not only the preaching, but the hearing and the, obe uh, the obeying. Lord, again, we love you and we thank you so much for today. Uh, in Christ's name, amen.